Starship Flight 2 is right around the corner, so what can we expect to see on this historic test flight? SpaceX has finally released information about the pre-launch and launch timeline. There's also been hazard notices from literally all around the globe that give us an idea of the trajectory that Starship will follow. So we've decided to piece everything together and give you an idea of what we expect to see on the day of launch and how that compares to the first flight of Starship. Sponsored by Factor. I'd be remiss if I didn't start this video off with a warning that this is not a video about when Starship will launch. We've done a bunch of videos on that, you can check them out, and of course we'll be doing multiple daily live stream updates as we get closer to launch, so you can stay up to date in real time. This video is instead about what we expect to see when launch finally happens. That way you can be the informed person in the crowd and when something looks like it exploded you can say, no, 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 that was supposed to happen. Or you can say, holy cow, something just exploded that was totally not supposed to explode. Now, some things for Starship Flight 2 will be completely different than the first flight, and some things will be basically the same. So let's just sort of run through the flow and refresh our memories, because you know it's been seven months since the last flight. Let's start off with pre-fueling activities. Now, SpaceX's website only mentions events that occur after the launch director has given the go for propellant loading at T minus two hours. But if you've watched our streams, you know there's a lot that happens before this. So this is a good place to start things off. These events are very important because the launch window may just be a few hours long, and depending on when they happen, this timing can give us an idea as to whether or not SpaceX is on track for the opening of the window, the middle of the window, or if they're running way behind altogether. This sort of happened on Starship's first launch attempt on April 17th. The timing of the pre-fueling activities was sort of telling us that the launch attempt would not be happening towards the beginning of the window, and that it would most likely be an hour or so into it. There's three events to look out for in pre-fueling. That's pad and road closure, the orbital tank farm spooling up, and the orbital launch mount and the launch tower venting. Before attempting any flight, both the launch pad and the road need to be closed at Starbase, including Boca Chica Village, which is evacuated completely. There are multiple roadblocks in place along Highway 4 that are set up during these launch preparations, but the last one, the one closest to the launch site, goes away when the tank farm is about or already in the process of spooling up. When we refer to the tank farm spool up, what we mean is that this set of ground support equipment and tanks just becomes a lot more active. It's like a dormant giant that wakes up and makes a ton of noise with venting, purging, and all sorts of processes. One of them consists of filling up the liquid oxygen and liquid methane subcoolers with liquid nitrogen. These subcoolers contain a bath of liquid nitrogen inside of them that cools down the methane and oxygen and allows them to be loaded onto Starship at lower temperatures than their boil-off temperature. This process can be best seen on the methane subcoolers, which get pretty frosty when they're loaded with liquid nitrogen, to the point where you can even see the frost rise on the side of the subcooler. At the same time, other systems and pipes get chilled down at the tank farm, and we start seeing a lot of venting from all sorts of places like the recondenser, the vaporizers, and then there's one vent we just call the Pope vent. Once the tank farm is all spooled up and the subcoolers are full of nitrogen, then it's time to chill down the pipes that head over to the orbital launch mount and up the launch tower. You will notice this happening because there's a vent on the side of the orbital launch mount and there's also a vent on the tower when this happens. The first one to pop up will be the orbital launch mount vent, followed by the tower vent a few minutes later. This chill down of the GSE is important because if you flow cryogenic liquid through ambient temperature plumbing that is by comparison relatively hot, you can cause all kinds of problems including thermal shock and potentially even damage to valves and other systems. Now, with the orbital launch mount venting and the tower venting, the stage is set for the launch director to give a go for propellant loading and at that point we will know we are at T minus two hours. Now, before we get into Starship's meal of tasty propellants, let me take a moment to tell you about the delicious meals I've been eating from this video's sponsor, Factor. Eating right or eating at all can be hard when you're busy. That's certainly the case for me when I'm running around Starbase all day shooting rockets. Our time is precious, and meal prep, cooking, and cleanup can all eat into that precious time, as much as I love cooking. This video's sponsor, Factor, eliminated these problems for me. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals that are both delicious and nutritious. And they let me skip a trip to the grocery store, which of course also eats up precious time. Mmm. Factor has over 35 meals you can choose from, and they're ready in just two minutes. Plus, if you're getting in the holiday spirit, right now they have limited time only fall flavors like cranberry pecan chicken and apple Dijon pork chops that will satisfy your seasonal cravings. 
You can also level up your meals with the Gourmet Plus options. You can make your meals even better by adding premium ingredients and meats. Factors meals are calorie conscious and meant to promote a healthy lifestyle that caters to your meal preferences. It's not just meals though, Factor also offers over 45 add-ons to suit various preferences and tastes. In this order, we got four bottles of absolutely delicious cold pressed juice that absolutely slaps. Th those are Sean's words, not mine. Click the link in the description and use code NSF50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. And thanks again to Factor for sponsoring this video. Mmm, that's good chicken. All right, now it's time to talk about propellant load. And while SpaceX's launch director will give a go for propellant loading at the T minus two hour mark, before then, there could be some other consumables loaded onto the vehicle, such as CO2, which goes into the large cylindrical metal tanks that are in the tower side chines. We know this could be the case because during the recent full stack wet dress rehearsal, we saw venting from the booster well before any propellant was loaded on board. This venting came right from the top of two of the booster's chines, where we know two big cylindrical metal tanks are housed. These tanks hold the carbon dioxide used in the booster's fire suppression system. This is one of the first big differences you'll see on the countdown towards this flight as compared to the previous one. While a sort of fire suppression system already existed on Booster 7, this one was nowhere near capable of doing the job of avoiding fires in the engine section. In fact, it was precisely these fires that doomed the first flight of Starship. For the second flight, this system is revamped with larger tanks and many vents around the bottom of the booster to let the gases escape during flight. But of course, these tanks need to be loaded, and when they're loaded, they start venting. This venting is not very regular though, but definitely watch out for the top of the chines facing the tower as these will be the ones that vent. Both booster and ship also have a multitude of composite overwrapped pressure vessels, or COPVs, that will be loaded along the way. But they don't vent, so they're not really as exciting or noticeable as the CO2 tanks. According to the timeline from SpaceX, start of propellant load on the booster will be at the T-1 hour and 37 minute mark. This is actually different from the first flight, but only by two minutes, so not that much. We know this will happen because the vent on the orbital launch mount will stop and we'll get a sidewards vent, I blame DOS, on the methane subcoolers. At this point, we're just a few short minutes away from frost appearing on the rocket. Frost will appear first on the booster oxygen tank, the one at the bottom, and then a few minutes later, it'll appear on the booster methane tank, the one up top. Simple, right? Well, things get a bit more complicated soon after this because it'll be time to load propellant on the ship. However, instead of both oxygen and methane being loaded at the same time, each one is loaded at a different time. At T minus one hour and 17 minutes, the methane load will start on the ship, followed four minutes later by the start of oxygen load. There's a bit of timing difference here as well compared to the first flight. Methane and oxygen are loaded five and four minutes later respectively. Despite the oxygen being loaded later than the methane on the ship, it'll be the liquid oxygen tank of this vehicle that will get frosty first. Then a few minutes later, it will be the same for the methane tank on the ship. From this point on, more and more propellants will get loaded on board and the frost on the tanks will continue to rise. We've seen it with the first launch and wet dress rehearsals, so you know kind of what to expect with this. From this point on, more and more propellant will get loaded onto the vehicle and the frost will continue to rise on the sides of the tanks. In case you're wondering, the frost will stop rising in this order. First, the ship's methane tank, then the ship's liquid oxygen tank, then the booster's methane tank, and finally, the booster's liquid oxygen tank is the last one to get fully frosty. Once this point is reached, the tanks are pretty much full with maybe some potential final top-offs left to perform in the final few minutes of the count. At the same time as all this is happening, we expect to see some venting from the ship's header tanks because those also get loaded at the same time as all of the other propellant. The timeline SpaceX released does not mention when this will happen, but we know it happened on the first flight and for the Ship 25 and Booster 9 wet dress rehearsal. So while we can't exactly tell you when the header tanks will get loaded, we expect to see some sort of activity from these tanks to start start to come up around the T minus 15 minute mark. Another thing that will happen in this time frame is Raptor engine chill down, which SpaceX says will happen at the T minus 19 minute and 40 second count. For comparison, this process starts three minutes earlier than on the first flight. The engine chill process cools down the Raptor pumps to their operating temperature before flowing oxygen and methane through them at full flow. In order to cool down these parts of the engine, a small amount of liquid oxygen and liquid methane are flowed through each respective side of the engine. Now this means that there will be gaseous methane and gaseous oxygen produced. And while the methane is reclaimed, the oxygen is vented overboard. For the booster, a set of collecting pipes on the orbital launch mount 
bring the gaseous oxygen out to a retention pond-like structure several meters away from the pad. For the ship, you'll see two pipes running down the side of the vehicle that will get frosty and will start venting when engine chill happens. In the final few minutes of the count, a lot of things start to happen concurrently. Things like pressurizing the tanks for flight, releasing the OLM hold down clamps, arming the FTS system, and switching the vehicle to internal power, plus a bunch more. Unfortunately, we just don't have an exact time for when each of these things happen, as SpaceX did not include them on the timeline they released. One of the things we do know about the last few moments of the count is what will happen in the last minute of it. Starship's countdown features an optional hold point at the T-40 second mark that can be used to finish work on the rocket or other systems ahead of liftoff. For the first attempt of Starship's first flight on April 17th, we saw teams pausing at this point in order to work through an issue with the booster pressurization system. This eventually led to a scrub and a recycle on April 20th. But even on the 20th, SpaceX again paused the count at the T-40 second mark to finish some final closeouts and some last minute work on the rocket. The bottom line here is, if SpaceX pauses the timeline at T-40 seconds, don't panic because that doesn't exactly mean it's an instant scrub. Once the hold is lifted, the launch director will give their final go for launch, and the launch pad systems will prepare for the terminal count. At T minus 25 seconds, the fire X system will start. This system purges the area underneath the booster of any potential problem causing gaseous methane or gaseous oxygen by using a mixture of water and gaseous nitrogen. It's like Topo Chico, but for Starship and in instead of carbon dioxide, it's nitrogen. Okay, so it's nothing like Topo Chico. Just let me have this, okay? The fire X system was put in place to mitigate events such as the Booster 7 spin prime explosion, where flammable gases accumulated below the booster and the orbital launch mount. The system is still in place and will still be used for Starship's second flight, so no big difference here as compared to the first flight. However, just after this, there is a huge difference to the countdown, starting at T minus 10 seconds, when the flame deflector will activate and start spraying tons and tons of water all around the launch pad. This is basically Starship's water deluge system. We have an entire video all about this system that you can check out, but in short, it should help avoid the massive concrete and rock tornado that we saw on Starship's first flight. Hopefully. The whole activation sequence for the deluge is very fast, and it only takes a few seconds from the first signs of pressure through the pipes to water coming out at its full potential. Another big difference for this flight will be the Raptor startup sequence, which will begin at T minus three seconds, instead of beginning at T minus eight seconds, like on the first flight. This essentially prevents the engine from firing at the base of the pad for too long, and again, will hopefully mitigate any concrete and rock tornado type situation. This is yet another thing that SpaceX is doing to try and prevent damage to the pad. Hopefully, Raptors firing against the deluge for a shorter period of time will result in, again, a mitigation of the whole concrete and rock tornado thing. Of course, at this point, we enter the post-launch phase, and hopefully we see Raptors lifting the ship and the booster off of the pad. From this point on, caution is warranted, as all possible outcomes are on the table. The launch timeline published by SpaceX only applies for nominal conditions, aka if the engines aren't blowing up and if the rocket doesn't lose control like on the first flight. With all the engines ignited, liftoff will be achieved once they've throttled up, and the total thrust passes the total weight of the vehicle. For the first flight, SpaceX didn't indicate when this would happen in the count. For the second flight, it is indeed indicated. It appears that this, quote, first motion, also known as liftoff, will happen two seconds after T0. This is somewhat of a departure from SpaceX's other rocket, the Falcon 9, which lifts off at exactly T0. With liftoff, the first stage of flight begins, and that means we'll get to see if the booster's fire suppression system avoids fires in the engine bay, and if the water deluge system allows the launch pad to hold up better under the force of all that thrust. The booster's fire suppression system will be a very interesting difference to take note of on the second flight of Starship as compared to the first, as, again, on the first flight of Starship, this system was nowhere near as robust as is the one installed on Booster 9. So while Super Heavy and Starship climb up through the atmosphere, we'll very likely start to see some sort of condensation or vapor coming out of the engine section, which could potentially look really cool. The nominal time for the vehicle to reach maximum aerodynamic pressure is the T plus 52 second mark. Now, this is three seconds earlier than on Flight 1, but when going over the speed of sound, three seconds can really mean a lot. For those more interested in the trajectory, the first stage of flight will take the rocket out towards the east and above the Gulf of Mexico, similar to the first flight. But of all of the things to look out for during launch, I'd say the most obvious and most important one will be stage separation. Why? 
This is totally different than for the first flight and will involve a technique called hot staging. We've also covered this in way more detail on earlier videos, but now we actually have the times of when things are happening thanks to the timeline that SpaceX released. Straight off the bat, I have to give a shout out to whoever it was at SpaceX that wrote this timeline because they've totally redefined the meaning of Miko, which typically means main engine cutoff, but in the new Starship timeline, it means most engines cut off because the booster won't shut off all of its engines during hot staging. Although I guess you could argue that the booster had a most engines cut off event on the first flight as well. According to the timeline, the Raptor engines on the ship will start two seconds after most engines cut off on the booster. Although the timeline does not specify if that's all of the ship's engines or just a subset of them. We think that this time refers to the time at which the ship Raptor vacuum engines will ignite. This is because of the way the shield on the top of the hot staging ring is just a mere few inches away from the sea level engine nozzles, but far enough away from the vacuum engines. It sounds very unlikely that these sea level engines would ignite right when they're so close to that shield, and instead they'll ignite once the ship is a small distance away from the booster. Another interesting thing to note here is that the nominal time for Miko on the second flight of Starship is a full 10 seconds earlier than on the first flight. This could be due to the engines running at a higher throttle setting, consuming more propellant per second and reaching the required conditions for staging much earlier than they were planning for on the first flight. Right after the ship separates, the booster will flip to initiate its boost back burn. But notice, SpaceX doesn't mention on the timeline that the engines that were still igniting during staging will shut down before that boost back burn begins. So it could very well be that the booster will use these engines to aid the flip and avoid having to relight them. In fact, if you see the flight profile infographic, the engines do appear to still be on when it shows the flip before the boost back burn starts. So the time indicated for boost back burn startup may very well be the time when a number of other engines on the booster will be reignited to start that part of the booster's flight. While the duration of the booster's boost back burn is about the same as was planned on the first flight, the time between staging and the start of this burn has decreased from 19 seconds to 12 seconds. These six seconds matter a lot when the booster is flying at almost two kilometers per second away from the launch pad. So this faster flip and burn, as we call it, would be much more optimized with this new staging method than the one previously planned for Starship. Now, of course, the booster is not headed all the way back to the launch site and will instead target a spot out in the Gulf of Mexico for a simulated landing. Since the stage separation and boost back burns start up earlier for flight two, this also means the landing burn occurs much earlier, with it being planned to occur a whole minute and 10 seconds before the time planned on the first flight. The simulated landing burn is also planned to be a bit shorter, with it being 18 seconds long instead of 23. But of course, that's only if the booster gets all the way to this point, which hopefully it does, but hard to say until it happens. While all of this is happening with the booster, the ship will continue on, firing its six engines for almost six minutes to insert itself into the ballistic trajectory that will bring it on over to Hawaii. We said that the first stage will be heading east out of Starbase, and well, the ship will continue going east. The nominal plan calls for the ship to thread the needle between Cuba and Florida and go three quarters of the way around the globe. During this time, Starship will overfly the Atlantic Ocean, the southern parts of Africa, the Indian Ocean, and then will go straight for entry over the Southwest Pacific Ocean. All of this is basically the same as for the first flight, even down to the times in the timeline. And of course, just like the first flight, the ship is not going to be recovered. And while SpaceX says exciting landing, we all know what exciting landing means. It means, it means kaboom. Now I have to mention again, all of the things we've mentioned in the post-flight phase of the timeline are only under nominal conditions. And if you remember the first flight of Starship, conditions weren't exactly nominal. Things may very well fail on this second flight and that's okay. But it's important to note that even if only a few of the booster's engines shut down early, and even if it survives ascent unscathed and makes it through hot staging, that will still affect the timings of things on the post-launch timeline, as it will change the vehicle's altitude, speed, and other parameters. Maybe leave a comment below and let us know if you think how the flight will go and what you think will ultimately happen. I personally think that if the vehicle makes it through hot staging, that'll make flight two a great success. Either way, excitement is guaranteed. So stay tuned because we'll of course be covering everything live as it happens. Once again, thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to head on over to factor75.com now and use code NSF50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. All right, that's it for this video. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and as always, be excellent to each other.